Today with me, a social media influencer who has amassed a following of millions of followers across all platforms. If you are a Middle Eastern person, you've probably seen her hilarious sketches on TikTok and Instagram. If you follow her on YouTube, she's famous for her famous rants that men and women can relate to, but especially the women love. Alyssa Yago, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you so much for having me, Manuel. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, I've known about you for a little while now. I've heard your name here and there, but I was like, let me look into this girl because like you, to be honest, there's not that many uh, Assyrian dem, uh, women who have captured the demographic of the Assyrian women. The majority of the time, it's men. We have our Amina rated. You have mm -hmm. some people that are there, but not at your level. I mean, you've done something really amazing with your social media account. Was that on purpose? Was it an accident? Was it something intentional? Can you tell me about that? Yeah, well, I've always loved social media. I've always wanted to be somebody with a voice. Um, at first, I started YouTube and um didn't really take off this was like eight or nine years ago i was like a little kid i was posting on my ipad and then youtube um slowly kind of started dying down because of TikTok. everybody was talking about TikTok, and i was like i need to start doing this i was going on this app and i was like on this app for like four or five hours a day and i was like it's so addicting these people are so funny i want to be a part of this so literally with zero followers i just started posting about my day posting rants, posting anything, literally anything. If I was walking to my car, walking, getting the mail, if there was something in my mind, if there, if I had a thought in the shower, I would literally leave early, dry my hair, turn my phone on and post like literally whatever I was thinking. And, and slowly people really enjoyed this content and started following me. And people started like, I guess they just liked me being me. No matter what I did, I just was myself. I didn't really change. Even when I like got closer with my other TikTok friends and, you know, they told me like things I should be doing with my my app or with my platform, there was a lot of things I could be doing to be growing faster, but it never really seemed to like stick with me. I just wanted to talk and I just wanted to kind of have this vulnerable state with my followers. So mm. it just happened out of nowhere. And with the whole being a Syrian thing, um, it kind of happened after I hit a million followers, I then started um, discussing on my account that I was a Syrian and, um, you know, started talking about some issues and, uh, people loved that I was a Syrian people that didn't know I was a Syrian, you know, followed me because I was a Syrian and the people that were already a Syrian who followed me, they were very happy that I was right on. So I think people want to figure out who the person that they're following really is. So I want to dive into your, your background, where you mm -hmm. came from. So I, not many people know this about you, right? But mm -hmm. On, on social media, you show yourself as like a genuine person. You're not afraid of being who you are. You're unapologetic. You act silly sometimes. You're unpolished. Yeah. But I would argue <laughs> that you actually had a very difficult background that not too many women would be able to to get through if they were mm -hmm. in your shoes. Yeah. Knowing knowing what you've been through. And so I think a lot of people would have crumbled under the pressure. And so can you just walk me through some of the major events that happened in the last six of your six years of your life? Yeah, so the last six years of my life have been crazy, nonstop, like go, go, go. That's why I chose this background because, you know, I've traveled a lot, I moved a lot. This is exactly like who I really am, kind of on the inside. Um, I would have stopped, you know, if I had a, a closed minded mentality, I would have stopped. I would have mm -hmm. gave up. I would have let what happened to me kind of stay with me. Um, but I use it honestly as my driving motivation to do literally everything. Around six years ago, I'd say maybe seven years ago, my brother got really like sick. He was really ill. Um, he had cancer. So when somebody in your family has cancer, it's like everybody has cancer. You Older know? or younger? This is my younger brother. Younger by one year. Yeah. So he's 18 now? Yes, he's 18 now. He's wow. doing great. Uh, you should see him. Like, I tell this story from my point of view. Like, I'm, I was the watcher of this, but you know, he has my story, but also went through all the struggles that I went through, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, I look up to him in a lot of ways. He's one of the strongest person, you know, he's the strongest person I know, you know? Um, so he fell ill and, you know, it changes the dynamic of your family, you know? Something that like was so little to me, like, you know, going on Xbox at night, like with him, turned to like me having to sneak up like pudding cups from the cafeteria because he like slept through snack time because of his chemo. And it was like these little moments of life that like you used to value as a kid completely change you know i had to wipe down his legos with clorox and bring him to the hospital and like all of this stuff and it was like things that little kids shouldn't be going through we went through but we did it together and you know we're closer than ever i really think he is like my best friend and then it was crazy because once he was healed like you know we were so like happy you know obviously um 
it was a big it was big news for the family everybody was celebrating it was like a turn of events we're like you know finally things are looking up and then this was literally like uh i'd say like six months after this happened after he was cleared my mom she sits us at the table and she's super serious and she has this very serious like you know kind of aura around her she's not a very serious woman and she was like yeah i have it too and we were like, there is no way this is how I remember like right then and there, I was probably, I think I was 12 years old. I was like, God isn't real. I was like, none of like, I was like, life is not fair. There's no way you could sit in my face and tell me that God exists when this stuff happens. Right. And I was like 12 years old. Like this was so new. And I was going to high school soon. Right. So by the time I was 13, she passed, she had passed away and I had to start high school. I had to start like boy issues growing up you know hitting puberty and you have to run it by your middle eastern father like literally like oh brother uh like i <laughs> it was so bad like i would like uh it was just so awkward but honestly i had to find who i was as a woman like i had to find my feminine side i had to find what a woman really meant with the lack of a woman in my life so i grew up with my brother and my dad um and to take on the role of a woman in the house is crazy. Like, I really give it to women. Like, women women are like, oh, I want to be a stay-at-home mom. It is crazy how much they have to do. Because when I was little, right, I was put in the position where, you know, I had to start learning how to cook and clean because my mom wasn't there. Then I had to balance my grades from high school. And I also had to look after my brother, who was also still healing. And, like, I had to do all of these things that, like, a child wouldn't usually do. So this matured me very fast. Like this matured the way I thought, the way I interacted with other people. This this changed how scary things don't seem so scary to me. Because when you lose somebody that is like literally everything to you, mm -hmm. like there is not much you could lose or not much you fear anymore. You were right? very close to your mom. I was very close to my mom. And, and lots of people don't think that way because of how I recovered from it and how I don't talk about it and how it doesn't bother me anymore. But my mom was my best friend. Everything you see, my my demeanor, the way I look, the way I talk, the way I dress is my mother, like 100 percent my mother. Everything I do is is basically her. So then this is this is a crazy part. So then uh, maybe like a year after that, my father tells me we're moving to California. We were in Canada. OK, we lived in Canada. I lived in Canada my whole life for the first 15 years of my life. So but I didn't know that, though. I didn't know how good California was. Right. I'm like, yeah. at this point, I'm 15 years old. I'm like, there's no way I lost my family. Sorry. No, you're good. I lost my family. You know, all of this is new, 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 new. Go, go, go. Like one thing is changing after another. I don't even have time to adapt. I don't have time to even like, you know, get my stuff straight. I'm like, this is crazy. And then we move leave everybody behind. I came to America with like one suitcase. My my dad moved here for work. So he moved here. He had an opportunity and um, he moved to California. I think my dad also just wanted to get us out of, you know, the same environment. The same environment. Right, yeah. Right. Because when it happened, like we moved houses and then I think he just wanted a fresh start. I think that's really, really wanted because my dad isn't a very emotional person. He's very um, strong. Would I, you say your mom was the rock of the family? Who would I, you say the rock of the family is or was? I would say it was. I would say it was my mom. I'd say at the time it was. But um, yeah, it was my mom. But recently over these years, I, I feel like my dad has stepped up. Like this changed his life as well. Obviously, he's not going to talk about it. You know, he has that that demeanor to him. But um, yeah, when when we first moved, it was a big change. It was like, OK, so no mom, no friends, no cousins, no family, no nothing. New people. Canada was very different. I lived in, like, you know, a smaller town. The population was a lot smaller. People, the culture even was different. Like even from Canada to America is very different or Canada to I'd say like near Toronto to mm -hmm. California. Very different people here. You know, even the way they talked was different for me. Um, so I had to adapt to that. Like when I went to the American high schools, I was like, there's no way there's actual cheerleaders with the bows and they actually date like the, the, uh, the jocks, football. Right, yeah. Right, right. And they're like sitting in these little it's high school musical, Yeah, literally high school musical. I was like, there's no, I like, I remember I specifically, it was the first day of high school. I'm pissed. I'm wearing my Nike tech, my Nike sweatsuit, like kid. Okay. Like, okay, bud, relax. Okay. And I walk in there. I'm all like, you know, angry with life. 
And then this girl comes up to me. She's like, hi, like, da, da, da. she has a bow in her hair talking to this. She's like linked arms with this, this football player. I'm like, there's no way this is real right now. Okay. <laughs> and then we have this pep rally and there's like people are, you know, shooting the, the, the cannons, the cannons the, yeah, and yeah. The, the balloons. And like these kids are doing like different games. I'm like, I'm literally living in a movie right now. There's no way. So yeah, I mean, by the way, most high schools in America are not like, yeah, that. I say like you lucked out and you got the one yeah. <laughs> high school that matches the movies. Yes. yes. None of it's like that. But I mean, that, that's all. Continue. Please continue. Yeah. So it was it was just so surreal. And then um, slowly, slowly, I started, you know, adapting to my environment. And I feel like that was something kind of difficult. That's something difficult for most people is to adapt to their environment. And it's such a crucial thing to grow is to understand that you cannot go back to what you used to have. Right. You can't, You even if you live in your past, in your mind, you are still sat, like I'm still sat in front of you, no matter how much I miss my mom. I'm still sat here with a mic in front of my face. Like, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like I can't just think and dwell on the past. Like life mm -hmm. moves on. And I feel like once I understood that, I was able to put everything that happened past me and focus on my future. And that was the biggest shift in my mentality is, if I'm not thinking about right now, I'm thinking about what's going to happen in the future because you can you can change the future. You really can. You can change the directory of your future mm -hmm. and you can change what you do right now, but you cannot change the past. That's the one thing you can't change. So it's like if you're constantly there, it's it's literally it's what kills people. It really is. It's like, a philosophy called stoicism. And in the stoic philosophy, it says that we don't share anything except the present. Mm -hmm. You and I right now in this moment is the only thing we share. When we watch back this video. Technically, we captured the present moment, but it's also in the past. Ironically, the past is gone. We can't touch it. The future doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. So that's the only thing that we share the, 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 the present. When you were in high school, when you got there, you said you came in with this mean demeanor. You're mad at life. Were you acting up in classes? Were you causing problems? Were you the class clown trying to get attention? Like, how were you coping with your, your whole adjustment to America? So I was coping through social media and I was coping through like just I had this, yeah, I guess I was just angry. I wasn't very an open person. So I was causing some trouble. I definitely was. Um, so on social media, that's what my therapy was. You know, most Middle Eastern families don't believe in therapy. They just, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> oh, I say the word and my dad gets mad. Don't, don't say that word. Don't say that word, you know? I think it's situational that people need therapy. Like, for like. There's a lot of people who are like, oh, I need therapy. Like they they result to it right away. And yeah. I'm like, okay, listen, there's a time and place for therapy to get to like deep rooted mm -hmm. issues that you need to work through. I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I the majority agree. of the time when people are like, no, I need therapy. No, you need somebody to sit there and, and plead with you and say, yes, you are depressed. Here's here's how you can fix it. Here's some medication that you can they want to hear that. They want to, they want to be fed into their, you know, instead of here's a here's a solution to your problems that isn't medica medication it's going to require a lot of work they don't want that they want someone to be like yeah now how'd you feel about that that's the, what they want the victimhood mentality that they have they're they're infecting into the rest of the world they want to be validated through their feelings and emotions and so the, i think like when it comes to that that's like yeah you should make fun of those people in my yeah. opinion because it's, <laughs> we need to be bullying yeah. back to a certain yeah, extent yeah. <laughs> but when you're trying to get to like a deep-rooted problem that's generational Mm -hmm. inflicted something that like you don't even think that you have but like other people see it in you then i think that's a great form of, of, of getting that out there so when you were using social media were you validated by like how much numbers that you were yes. getting was that how you got your self-worth from yes yeah. so you know the whole saying like if somebody's like a class clown they go home and they're like you know they have some issues at home there's a reason why they're looking for that validation that attention that love from other people it's a very sad thing um, I did that through social media, you know, I, it's interesting you admit that too. Cause a yeah. lot of people will be like, no, I never had that problem. You have, no, no, no. I was no, always I good, but like you're being vulnerable about yeah, it. So I respect 100%, that. Like, thank you. But 100%, that's, that's what I did. I, because the thing is, is I was raised in a family where it's like, don't be disruptive. You know, you're still a girl, keep yourself together. You shouldn't be doing this in front of people. You know what I mean? Like even at church, like don't embarrass me, stuff like that. But I agree. I agree. So I didn't want to go to school all the time. And that's my way of getting my attention. So what did I do? I closed my door. I put my phone up. Didn't matter what I was wearing. Didn't matter what my hair looked like. Didn't matter if my makeup was done or not. I had something to say and I wanted people to hear it. I didn't want to sit with it. And I guess it is therapy. I guess I did go that route where I wanted that validation from people. 
but that's in a time where I was healing, right? And then then it became my biggest joy. Then it became instead of I want people to hear what I have to say because I'm so sad right now or here's the thing. I was going through a lot of issues. So what I was doing is I was finding smaller issues that other people could agree with me on, if that makes sense. I didn't want to tell everyone this is my story. This is what I've been through. Everybody feel bad for me. But what I would do is if someone pissed me off at McDonald's in the line, it would ruin my whole day because I wasn't mentally, you know, and I take that and I go on the Internet and complain about it. And when people agreed with me, it made me feel good about myself, mm. which isn't good. It's not good. But that's how it was. And then and then slowly when I started getting out of that mentality, I wanted to start sharing positive things. I wanted to start sharing stories that people would laugh at. I wanted to start sharing things that people could relate to. I want it to be a safe spot because no matter like, you know, what you were just saying, everything we have is just right now, right? It's kind of, I know it's not like that, but in a way, no matter what anyone's going through in their homes, at school, in their past, they could all be present watching my video. And for a brief moment, all of the bigger issues that they have gone, they're worried about the one issue I'm talking about right there in that 15 minute clip. And then they can type whatever they want and scroll to the next video. That's literally what it was. Did it ever mess with you and you got negative comments? Because especially you're a young girl, you're impressionable at that time. High school is in itself or they're extremely oh, vulnerable school. and insecure as it is already. Yes. Now add social media on top of it. Now you have more eyeballs than what like, so we're walking through the hallway. You're worried about what five, six yes. people think of you. Now you're technically walking through the hallway of the internet yes. where thousands of people can see you and comment on you. So did that have a negative aspect to you? Did that alter the way that you perceived people in general? So in the beginning, I did not care at all. Now I care. So I'll get I'll also get into that. When I first started posting, it wasn't for other people. It was for me. I wanted to see the good comments so I could read what I wanted to read and whatever I didn't want to read, I wouldn't take that criticism. Mm. I wouldn't say, oh, this person thinks I'm this way and this person thinks I'm this way because I just had, I just wanted to talk. That's all it was. I really didn't care about people's opinions unless they were good. But now because I feel like I want people to relate to me, I want to be a safe spot. I want people to have a good, even if it's on the internet, relation with me. When I see these comments, sometimes they do kind of get to me, but it's never about my appearance when people talk about my appearance because beauty is fleeting. Everybody looks the same when they're old. They all look wrinkly, they're all balding, and they all have gray hair. Beauty does not mean anything to me. But when they talk about who I am as a person, then it starts to hurt my feelings. And I feel like that's also deep rooted with some other things, right? So. Yeah, I mean, for, I think a lot of people on the internet aren't even real, to be honest yeah. with you, they're just bots. Or like, <laughs> it, some of my best friend had a video and he posted it. And it was like this, it's about quiet quitting, right? And yeah. It, most viewed video on YouTube, quiet quitting, almost 3 million views. Oh, he, wow. he went viral on it. Uh, he had a lot of celebrities reach out to him to have him on his show. And so like, he got a lot of traction. There are people in the comment section being like, oh, this guy's a CNN watcher. This guy's a Fox News watcher. I'm just like, dude. Literally what? That's like the craziest statement to say because you never even met this guy. Based off of a 20 minute video, you're like, oh, you just categorize him in this box completely. And it's like, when I realized that, I was, and some people have even called me an atheist online. They're like, oh, look at this guy. He doesn't even believe what? in God because I was asking questions yeah, to religious yeah. figures. So I, I realized then and there, I'm like, oh, you can't read these comments because you can't. these people are, it's an insane asylum. It's literally in an insane. Because they're crazy. This is, I was talking about this. Okay. Imagine at the end of every single interaction in real life, you get a receipt of what everybody thought of you. That's literally a comment section. Who are you to sit under my video? and tell me who I am, Ugh, get out of my face. So also another thing, how many times do you, like personally, mm -hmm. sit in a comment section and actually like type a hate comment? Uh, never. Never, you wanna know why? Because you're a normal human being. You're a normal functioning member of society. These people who do these things genuinely, like if I try to think of all my friends, not one of them, not one, I can't even name one that would actually sit and do that. These are people that really don't have things going for them. Mm. And, and people forget that the thing is, is like, you know, like people used to get bullied, right? People used to get punched in the face. Give me your lunch money. People aren't as bold anymore. They know that they could get the same feeling of self-satisfaction through a comment section where they don't have to face repercussions to their actions. Right. So once I learned that, it does not matter. Sometimes it does hurt. You know, every once in a while you'll read a comment and you'll be like, wow, ouch. 
But what I have to say to that is maybe they are right. Because if it's hurting me in a way that, if I could shrug off most of the comments, but this specific one is hurting my feelings, that means in a way it is me because there has to be some sort of truth to that sentence for me to feel angry or upset about it. So I actually do sometimes take comments to fix myself instead of a negative thing. Like, why am I like this? Why am I doing this? Maybe I do speak really fast. Maybe I should slow down. Maybe it's just constructive criticism, you know? A lot of times it's not intended to be that way, but you could for sure spin it so it that's, benefits you. That's That's, that's the mature thing to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you are going to read the comment section. But I also realized this recently. It's like, if people are going to talk trash about you, it's actually none of, let's say people talking trash mm -hmm. about me. It's none of my business that people are talking trash about me. And I'll that's tell you why. True. Um, it has nothing to do, they're, they're entitled to their opinion. I agree. They can hate me if they want to. They can yeah. say, this guy sucks at asking questions. This yeah. guy doesn't look good. He dresses like he looks like Jay Leno from the 80s wow. with his jean shirts. They can say anything that they want. <laughs> yes. And so that's none of my business. Very true. And so I like that. when I see comment sections, I'm just like, oh, this is also none of my business. They're just verbalizing their internal thoughts. And so I let it be. I don't, I don't push it further than that. And I think it's just an insane asylum in itself. And when I see people <laughs> commenting, I think this is something that I need, to, I need to put out there publicly. Okay. Social media is meant to be an extremely addictive substance. Yes. You are supposed to be addicted to social media. They've created it to be that way. Yes. So when you see two people arguing in the comment section, they don't realize that all they're doing is pushing yeah. that post further through the yeah. algorithm for more people to see it and argue more and more. Yeah, that's so the guys point. that are arguing with like 30 comments deep, you're doing nothing except pushing that yeah. in the algorithm. Yeah. You're, you're, no one's going to be like, oh, yeah, you know what? That guy called me an idiot. I'm going to change my mind about how I believe yeah, this thing. Like what? Yeah. No, that doesn't work. Insulting people it's doesn't so work. It's so funny. I'll go. I'll be on a TikTok comment section. You're absolutely right. And it's like one comment. Outlandish comment. 72 replies. Yeah. Uh, do you guys not have jobs? Go touch grass. <laughs> like, do you not have families to attend to? Do you not have a gym to go to? Do you, like, this is great. Like, if you have all of this time to sit and argue with somebody you've never known, like, brother, like, really? Like, yeah. you're absolutely right. Like, it is addictive. And the whoever created the app, they're winning. They know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, and if I see people that I know arguing in my videos, because I've had a few videos where people are just mm -hmm. pissed. Yeah. I will DM them and be like, hey, man, I just need to let you know, you arguing with this person isn't going to change their minor perspective about you. And also, in a way, it's reflecting pretty badly about you. Yeah. Just everyone sees it. Just... How about stop? Yeah. I'm, I'm doing it to like yeah. save face for them. I, yeah. I mean, for me, I should be doing the opposite. Be like, uh, by keep the way, going, keep, keep going. Because yeah. my uh, more views, yes. more views, more views. But I don't want to subject people to that. Like, yeah. If you fall for a trick of a person trying to bait you into the comment section, I'll warn you. Like yeah. a fair, yeah. fair, fair warning right there. Um, You're in college now. Yeah. You're studying, but you've blown up on social media. So there's a dichotomy of oh, you yes. can make money on social media. You can make money in a career. Yeah. What did you want to be in high school? What are you studying now in college? And then we'll talk, we'll go further into that. These are great questions. So in high school, like I had no idea. Like I genuinely didn't know until I was in college and I switched my major. So I'll also get into that. But um, I didn't really have a lot of time to process everything that happened to me. So then I just went into this high school and everybody knew. In Canada, it's a little different. People don't know until they're in college. It's very slow. People do, most people don't even go to college. I'm not gonna say all of Canada, but in the city, I, the small city I was in, um, a lot of people don't go to college. They just get a job and go to work or work with their families because they don't think they're gonna ever leave Hamilton. Yeah. It's, it's like that, right? So I go from that small city to this bigger city where everybody is very, very um, competitive in the Bay Area. Everybody knows what they wanna be. Uh, doctor, lawyer, engineer. The Silicon Valley is yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So I didn't know until I reached college and I just went in as a business major because I was like, okay, business, everybody knows, like you can get somewhere with business. You know, you have a business, um, what's that called? Um, Associates? A degree, sorry, yeah. Oh, okay. A business degree, um, you're, you're yeah. eligible to get a lot of jobs that way. So I was like, okay, easy way out, you know? And then I really, uh, my platform started popping off and I found myself, I love writing. I love reading and I love writing. I'm writing two books right now. Wow. Yeah, I, I absolutely love it. And Fiction, nonfiction? Uh, one of them is a po poetry. It's a poetry book. And the other is a fiction book. Wow. Yeah, so I haven't even told anybody about my fiction book yet. So that's very exciting. But um, when it came to that, I was like, this is something I love. And I loved acting. I loved being directing, being on set. Love what we're doing here. Like, it just, this is like, like me. This is what I love. So I was like, okay, let's 
be a screenwriter. Let's let's have your ideas and put them into movies, books, TV shows. Let your like just the thought of being able to kind of write a scene, a script for an actor for them to then use your idea and bring it to life. That just gives me life. So I was like, this is what I want to do. So I started doing screenwriting and then it started helping me with my skits on social media because I'm taking these classes. What makes a character? How do you deepen a character? How can you make layers to your character? How they can speak, say whatever they want to do? Because if you have to think about it, like these characters in books and movies, TV shows, if you were to meet them in real life, like they would think a certain way, they'd act a certain way, they talk a certain way. So it was teaching me that I could actually bring these characters to life in what I was doing on TikTok. If I wanted to play an old middle-aged woman that was angry at life, these are the characteristics that she has. This is how I would write her and this is how I would act her out. So they actually kind of go hand in hand. Um, but having the two worlds is definitely weird. Like I'll come home from LA, all my friends went to an event, whatever, and then throw a hoodie on, throw some sweatpants on and go mask up into my college class and just sit there like everyone else. And I'm not saying like I'm better than anyone else and I do this and that, but it definitely is like you were balancing two worlds or you write, like you'll be on set, you'll be working with a company, a brand, they'll fly you out, whatever. And then you come and you sit in the class with everyone else. And it's humbling and I love it. And I wouldn't trade it for the world because it does humble me in a way. You're still just a college student. All of this is on your phone. The second you shut your phone off, you're just like everyone else. Do not put yourself at a, at a higher pedestal because you have some followers. But it does happen at school where people would recognize me and want to come talk to me or they, but it's, it's become, where I just became kind of friends with everyone mm. who um, watched my videos and uh, they're very supportive. And it's very nice to also have that. I have like a community in my college because of who I am on the internet. Has it ever gone to your head before? Not the numbers as in like, I feel better mm. than other people, but in the way where I start comparing myself to other creators. And this is a recent thing. This has never happened until I went to LA and I started filming with all my friends. And they're all like on their phones the entire time. They're like, oh my God, your video, like the RPM is this is it. And they're saying all of these terms I don't even know. And I'm like, okay, like what's going on? And we're all comparing our videos and like literally laid our phones flat and we're like literally dissecting. We posted all at the same time. Oh my gosh, yours has 10,000, it's been a minute. Mine only has, and like, then it started going, my mind started going crazy, like recently. I was like, oh my gosh, my video literally flopped. It's at 30,000 views, right? I was at a baseball stadium with my friend and I'm like, how many people do you think there are here? We searched it up, there's like 32,000 people and I'm sitting there and th that's the amount of seats, not even the amount of people. And I'm like, they're so, uh, do these people, like baseball players get nervous? Like this is a lot of people watching them. And to see the number in real life, I was like, this is when I think flops. This is what I think like, isn't good enough when I post it on my channel and I have 2.7 million followers and I was sitting in that baseball set. I stopped eating my peanuts. I was like, I'm sick. Like, there's no way I was like, this is surreal. It was a surreal moment. Come to Jesus moment. Yeah. For uh, seriously. Yes. I mean, the number one things that Americans fear in a statistic, I believe it was from 2017 or 2018 is public speaking. Mm. That's speaking in a room of like 10 people or more, right? Mm. Public speaking. Being on stage and speaking to 10 people more. Imagine a room of 100 people and then you post a video on TikTok or Instagram, 100 views. You're like, oh, what the hell? Yeah. Like my grandma can get 100 views yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> but then you realize you can't even do that in person. Yeah. And you got 100 views online, yes. let alone hundreds of thousands of views, hundred millions of views. It's like you you lose. Social media is like tasting the poison. Yes. You tasted the poison. Now you, you're disillusioned to what the reality of human beings truly is when yes. it comes to numbers. Like numbers don't mean anything to yes. us anymore because it we're doesn't. so used to seeing 2.7 million, 3 million, uh, all these old social media influencers who have millions of views. It's like you become disillusioned and also um, disenchanted yeah. in regards to it. So that's why I was just curious about that. But it's always when you compare yourself to others, the comparison is the thief of joy, as everyone says, it right? It is. Yeah, it really yeah. is. It's it's crazy. So it sounds like now you're, you're formatting college to a, actually assist with mm -hmm. your social media life and, and the benefits that could come with it, writing books, pushing the books, marketing, and all these good things. Now you let's get into some of the people that you work with. Ziad and uh, Farzan Akeem, if I pronounce their, their yes. names right. How'd you make that connection? How did you guys start making content together? 
what had happened is one of my friends, uh, her name is Holifer Adala on TikTok. She makes a Middle Eastern girl point of view TikToks. Okay. Uh, point of view, you're dating a Middle Eastern girl and she acts all crazy. I absolutely loved her content. I followed her. And then she reached out to me and she's like, I've been following you for a while, you know, um, and we kind of just went back and forth. I love working with Middle Eastern people just because I feel like the culture, obviously we're Middle Eastern. It's a, it's a kinship there. Yeah, it mm -hmm. feels like I'm talking to my cousins, you know what I mean? So she's like, uh, we're just keep trying to meet each other, greet each other, talk, make collabs, but it always fell through. Like somebody was busy or I was at school or I just had missed her or she got a flight somewhere else. But finally, I was in Irvine and I texted her and I was like, LOL, I'm in your hood. <laughs> and then she was like, you should pull up to this event. And I was literally so nervous. I, I've been doing social media for a really long time. I never made connections with anyone. With you, would you say that you just started making connections right as you got into social media? Yeah, I would say, well, so I had a base network mm -hmm. and then the, it expanded rapidly after yeah. I started posting for sure. Yeah. yeah, but it's like, it's like a tree, right? You get the trunk and then it just keeps going and going yeah. and going, right? I never even rooted that tree. It was just me and my phone against the world. Like that's literally what it was. So then I went to this grand opening. It was a coffee shop uh, and it was the Furha family. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But um, it's like this big family and they make content together and they opened a coffee shop in Irvine. And she's like, you should come. A lot of uh, people are gonna be there. Hmm. I had also followed um, his, he goes by Faruqi, Zay, Zay, okay. yeah. He goes by Faruqi. So I followed Faruqi a while back too and he was like, I was like, I love your content. You're so funny. And he was like, you're very funny too. This, that, the other thing. And so I saw all of them. I saw all of these people. They were all there. It's like my for you page was literally sitting in front of me. And it was a crazy moment. Like to see all of these faces that you've watched for so long just in front of you. Was it starstruck? Is that what it was? Yeah, it yeah. was weird. It was like seeing their face in 3D and like some of their bodies weren't like what you expected. And some of them were taller than, and it was so, I'm like, these are real people with just like me, you know, like I'm behind I'm, and I'm thinking like, do people who watch my videos think of this like me when they see me in person? And they're like, <gasps> I get a few of those every once in a while. And that's how I felt. I was like, oh my gosh. So I immediately started talking to everyone. At first I was nervous, but she saw me in the window and she came, she hugged me. She's like, oh my gosh. Like I known her forever. Mm. Starts introducing me to everyone, everyone. And I start talking to everyone. So Farzi or Farzan, it's his full name. Uh, I really clicked with him really like just off the bat click with him because he had a very similar mentality to me because um, immediately maybe like five minutes into our conversation I'm so thankful for this and I'm so thankful and I can't believe I was in high school this many this and the way he was talking I was like this person thinks like me and I like it and then Faruqi um, you know he's making his content he's just hilarious so um, I talked to him and we connected whatever but it wasn't until um, I went to film with them later because I had made those connections at the coffee shop. I maybe went back to Irvine three, four months later, and then I just hit all of them up, and then we started making content. Faruqi is the yeah. one who stuffs his shirt and says mother yes. shit, right? Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. I love that guy. I yes. love him. Okay, yeah. He's the best, and he's the same in person. Funny, like, oh, he's just a goofball. He's just, he's like this ball of light. He's just so funny those types of people. Now you've shifted your mindset before where it was like, it's just me and my phone therapy session. Now you see that it could actually be turned into a business. Yes. You post different content on different social medias. Mm -hmm. YouTube is still that way for you where it's like, put up the camera, record it, go. This is what I'm mm -hmm. thinking. Put it out there to the world. Now like Instagram and TikTok is more curated, mm -hmm. editing, sketches. It's Are you trying to keep those two things separate or bring them together? How exactly are you, are you trying to do that? So this is my, this is what keeps me up at night, by the way. It's like, do I start a new channel? Do I do this? Do I do this? It's like, what do I think people want? I am a very diverse person. Everything I have, I think 16 or 17 Spotify playlists of different genres of music. My bedroom is a collage of color and white and paint and this and that. I have four or five different hobbies at the same time. Social media is just an extension of who you are. So once I learned that I loved screenwriting and I can make skits, this is now a part of who I am, what I want to do with my future. So I honestly don't know at this very moment if I want to keep them separate or together. I'm just posting what I think is me on my YouTube, especially like I feel like when I want to talk to people, there's a lot to talk about now. There's a lot of issues to talk about. I can't get it out in a 15 minute 
or a 15 second video. I want to, you know, go for longer. So I started doing that. But, um, but those skits really did happen. When you said it was, uh, it turned more into a business. You're absolutely correct. Because when I went there, I'm thinking we're all like coming here to hang out, Mm -hmm. right? We're all coming here to talk and hang out, whatever. But this was the first time I stepped foot into the TikTok business world. All of these creators, like no shade at all. Like this is what they do. This is their like, you know, but it was, I, it was so surreal to me when it was like, hi, this is me. Oh, how many followers do you have? Oh, this is this. What's your app? And it was just a normal way of speaking. Oh, what con- kind of content do you do? Oh yeah. Do you want to be in my video? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Boom. Done. Film. Thank you. Shake hands. Done. Dude. Done. Like it was crazy. Or it's like, Hey, can you like so many times? Hey, can you film this? Yeah. I don't even know who they are, whatever. By the way, my name is this, this, this. Get your Instagram change, whatever. Boom, done. It's like business deal, business deal, business. And it was like, I was like, wow. Because for me, at that point of time, I was just throwing my phone up and treating it like a FaceTime call. And then I come here and I'm like, this is a real, this is a real deal. It's their livelihood. They do it full yeah. time, right? So do you feel like you're at a disadvantage now after seeing that side of things? And you're like, I have half my life in college and half my life. I'm not fully invested like they are or like full time like they are. Do you feel like you're falling behind them? Is there a pressure? Is there like, talk to me about that. Are you, are you, are you conflicted? Yeah. Sometimes at first I was very conflicted because all of them or most of them don't go to school. Like mm. they've dropped out of college. You can make good money on social media. So, um, I was conflict. I felt like I was behind all of a sudden, you know, I'm looking at my channel. I'm like, I'm doing so well. I'm very proud of myself. You know, God bless me. I kept saying that God bless me with this platform. God bless me. When I pray at night, I'm like, God, if this isn't for me, take it away, take it away, ban it, whatever. And actually my TikTok account did get banned. I heard about that. Yeah. Your first one. My first one. Why? Why did it get banned? Um, so this is some crazy stuff. Crazy. So there is, I didn't know this until recently, actually there. And, so there was these girls in my math class who had a following on TikTok, and I had passed them in numbers. And they apparently they were, well, not apparently, they were going through all of my account and just reporting all of my videos. And it got, and actually worked and it got taken down. Wow. Yeah, so. Why, then, did that not scare you for like, when you started up like a second account, like they would just do it again? So that's what it was in the time where I stopped, like my account got banned. And I would pray that prayer every night. I was like, this isn't for me or something was happening or something. So I gave it all up. And for a while, I did not have a TikTok. How I long did just, you go? I think it was five or six months. Okay. And I just kept praying and all of this, like things, I took a break. And then eventually I came back. So what it was is I already had two accounts. So I had a backup account. And that is my now main account. Mm -hmm. So I just stopped posting on my backup account and I took some time. I reflected, I did all my stuff. And then I knew this is what I needed to do. I knew like God gave me confirmation that I, regardless of what platform it is, I need to speak to a lot of people. I need it. I know that they're different. It says in the Bible that we have different gifts. And every single person needs to use that gift to exalt God, you know, to talk about God. And I know mine is being a bridge. My whole life I've been a bridge. I've connected people from Canada to America. My friend groups, I've uh, many different friend groups. I feel like I always bring them all together. Um, when it comes to social media, I have all of these different ways of thinking, all of these different uh, video ideas. And I bring different people who like different things together. So I feel like It's this unity that I love so much, regardless if it's on social media or not, but this has just been the best way I could do it is bring people together. And the way I think, including the way I think about God as well, it's kind of, it hits all of those boxes. It's like, I can talk about how I feel, why I feel the way I feel, how to be confident, for example, or how to, you know, be the best version of yourself. But through the Bible, I do that. This is why, it actually works because there's proof that it works because in this scripture, it says this. So it will really help if you do this, if that makes sense. No, it does make sense. And so it, people may be having trouble relating to what you're saying because they keep thinking about it in the lens of social media. But let me paint a picture for you like this for the people who don't create social media. Imagine one day that you're building a house or you're you're building a career and that career, that thing that you worked for, that investment Mm -hmm. that you put in, all of a sudden got stripped away from you. I think you're around 34,000 followers for your first account, right? When it got banned? 
I was at 600,000 followers. 600,000. Oh, snap. Okay. So that's, yeah, almost 7,000. That's a, that's insane. crazy. That's yeah. a crazy number. So like, imagine you build up all this time, energy, effort, and then all of a sudden you lose that. You know how demoralizing that could be for a lot yeah. of people? Like all that energy and effort is gone and you can't get that account back. And then to start from ground zero, it's like filing bankruptcy on social yeah, media, uh, essentially. There is some level of like mental fortitude and determination now because essentially like that's your online identification yes. in a way, right? Yeah. Like that's, that it is an extension of you. Yeah. It, it's like how you said, how a lot of people put food on their plate as well yes, now. Yes, it is. And that was taken away from you. Were you demoralized and starting again? Was it, were you like considering going full-time into school and saying screw this? Or were you just like, you know what? Um, whatever happens, happens. It didn't really affect you that much. It just bothered you. Like how, how deeply did it affect you mentally? It was really weird because it did not impact me as much as I thought it would. It wasn't my source of income at the time. I didn't even have a job. I think I was 16, 17 when I got banned. Mm. So I didn't make any income from it. And, um, at the time it was this weird turning point for my social media. It went from me, you know, complaining, whatever, when I first started to kind of, it was when my mental health was getting better. So then I started reaching a new audience and then boom, I started making Christian TikToks okay. so much. I was on Christian TikTok for maybe six, no, five months, I'd say strictly Christian content. Boom, 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 boom. And, um, it was then where it got banned. So I was very, very into my, and I'm still into my religion, but I was like, this is a sign. Maybe I need to take a break because I'm putting it in front of everything I have. Um, and in a way, honestly, it was kind of like a relief. I was like, oh my gosh, like for a little bit, I don't have anything. I don't, I'm not on anybody's phone. I'm not under the microscope of anyone. In a way, it was kind of like a weight off my shoulder. But um, literally what made me start again was when um, I got that confirmation. And I also knew like whenever I wanted to like let my feelings out and I went to put my phone up, and the app wasn't there anymore. I was like, I was like, what do I do? What do I do? Do I call someone? Like, do I make a new friend and like talk to them about my day? Like, so that's also what made me go back. It was like, I actually relied on it to like speak about my feelings. Like you said, you do make serious content. You, you talk about serious topics. And I actually do think you have a lot of interesting perspectives, especially being someone as young as yourself. I'm not saying I'm an old man. Yeah. People would argue I am. My perspective, a lot of 19, 18 year olds are, being deep, you know, yeah, like they're not, they I don't, they don't mean. care about that. They want to go out, they want to have a good time. Mm -hmm. They don't care about the, the morality and principles and f philosophical perspectives of life. And that's, I think that's a problem with the world today, but like you actually have some interesting perspectives in, in your, a lot of your videos, which we'll get to, but you're also considered, in my opinion, a comedian because you make sketches, you make people laugh, you get millions of views and then, you know, you write and I, that's a very comedic um, category. Yeah. Some people, like how you were saying, will constantly recognize you from social media. And they're like, oh, that's the girl that makes funny sketches. Yes. That's how they know you. Yes. But you also have a serious side. Yes. Does that conflict when you're trying to be serious? Do you ever worry when people are like, oh, no, she's just joking. That's just how Alyssa is. Or do you just take it with a grain of salt and then you're able to get people to realize you're being serious? Do you ever have that problem with getting people to take you seriously? Sometimes, yes. Especially because when I do talk, I have a certain way of talking. I'm very like animated you right so even if i'm talking about something very serious sometimes people could just brush it off or just be like lol i love her like but i'm like no like this world's dying like you know or like, <laughs> like it's not that funny or when it comes to like like for example like andrew tate i don't think I, I could probably count the amount of times on my hand where he's like made a joke in an interview unless it was like a deep rooted like right but people take him seriously because that's who he is on social media he's the serious kind of person um, so sometimes it can get really conflicting and that's why I kept my TikTok more like funny. And, and I also did it in a way where it's like this. Okay. YouTube, when you're on YouTube, you have people with a little bit more of brain capacity. Like yeah, you, you agree. Form content. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Longer form content. They can sit and actually watch a video. Um, and it's usually older. I'd say, I'd say above 17 is usually the age range on YouTube. Below 17 is all on TikTok. Mm. Um, and that's because like, even though I'm 19, I'm pretty young. I still grew up with YouTube. I grew up with Logan Paul, Jake Paul, all of the, even though it was like still brain rotting content, it was still on YouTube. I still had to sit there for seven, eight, nine minutes. So for that, like my more serious topics are on my YouTube. 
how you're not you're not ugly you're just stupid okay if i'm telling an eight-year-old that good like gg right if i'm telling like these are things that i think older people would enjoy and that could actually sit through versus TikTok where it's like just short, fast paced. I just want to laugh. Thank you. Bye. Thank I see. You, bye. you keep your audiences separate. Yes. I, that's smart. I see. Okay. But it does conflict though, because right. when people see myself on YouTube, they're like, oh, this is the girl that does the pigeon neck. Really? And I'm like, oh, well, valid, really valid because your credibility is as much as your online personality, who you are kind of people have like a trailer of yourself. Right in their mind already. Yeah, the, I mean, public perception is key and how the world view you, views you is how the world will treat you, right? Yes. So you control the narrative on your life. You can tell the people, you can tell the world who you are, you let the world tell everybody who you are, right? But right. you also Real. put yourself out there in public to, by the way, I didn't come up with that quote. That was a quote from Patrick or David. Yeah. Um, if you put yourself out there public, you're agreeing to be a public figure that's supposed to take criticism. Like yes. you, you are signing up for this. So in a way, if you complain about being criticized or being offended or like people are like, you're this way, you're that way. You you don't have a right to complain about you don't. it. I'm not saying you specifically. No, I'm saying like I agree. social media content creators because a lot of people victimize themselves. They're like, oh, look at all these people who hate me. I'm like, dude, Boo. you started this. Like you put yourself out there for criticism. Literally what happens when you're at a restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. And and the waiter brings you silverware that's dirty, right? And you're like, oh, mom, I'm embarrassed. Don't tell the waiter, don't tell the waiter. And she's like, this is dirty. Go get me a new one, right? And then you're like, mom, I'm so embarrassed. Like, why would you say that? And they're like, it's their job because it is their job. It's our job. It's our job to get, if we do something wrong, if we're under this microscope or this, you right, people are going to say, I don't like what you did this. I don't, because we're up for we're, our opinions. Mm -hmm. Our personality is dead. It's really up for debate. Absolutely. If you agree yeah, or not. These are just opinions yeah. and they're strong points and we could bring up facts, but that doesn't yeah. mean that everyone <laughs> has to agree with what we're saying. I agree. I yeah. agree with that. So when you were talking about like, how I'm 19, how were you when you were my age? Would you say that you had like, did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Or were you kind of like more go with the flow? Or how were you when you were my age? 19, I thought I was gonna work as an engineer until the day that I died. I was 100% in college. And mm -hmm. so like I was going for my degree. I didn't even think about creating content. I didn't make my first video until I was 21. So I made oh, my wow. first video uh, the day after I turned 21. Oh my goodness. So I got back from Vegas as all 21 year old yeah, men yeah. do, made my first video. And then that was when I started to see the public perception being like, they're taking it. And I was like, okay, maybe I do another video. Maybe I do another video. And they kind of just spiraled into what I do now. Um, a lot of reasons why I started, but that's besides the point. When I was 18, 19, I was only thinking about how do I make as much money as I fast, mm -hmm. as fast as possible. I was like, okay, I'm good at math. I mean, I'm bad at science. I don't want to be a doctor or an engineer. What can I make money with math? Okay, engineering. So that's why I chose engineering because I was good at math. I wanted to make the most money as fast as possible. Yeah. Four years degree, there you go. So no, I didn't even think about creating content back then. It was wow. not even on my mind. I, I was, um, I would say that I was extremely immature at 18 and 19 than most 18 and 19 year old women would compare it to like mature. Like for example, I look at you, I'm like, you could pass off as like a person in her mid twenties in terms of maturity. You would look yeah. at me at 18, be like, yeah, that's an 18 year old guy. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Like it's a guy who plays video games, plays basketball <laughs> yeah, yeah. with his friends every weekend and, and that's it. So yeah, to answer your question, no, I didn't think about it. Oh wow, okay. And then, and then do you think that your morals changed as you got older or were 100%. you always, yeah? No, they've changed so much. Wow. They've shifted a complete. I always had a baseline I've had a baseline um, standard of morals mm -hmm. and values because I grew up in a Christian household, yes, because I was in yes. the church, because my parents actually were like very, I don't want to say ruled with an iron fist, but they were always in my ear. Yes. They always directed me in the right direction. And I, I truly believe I have the, the best parents in the world because my dad would pick us up from school. My mom and my dad would both be working. My dad would pick us up from school. And in that 25 minute car ride home, my dad was in me and my brother's ear all the whole way in that car ride, giving us advice and not only just giving us advice, but like, you, you know, that person, you know, that person, your cousin, your friend that did that. He would use real life examples and he would always say, I'm not putting these people down, That's but what my dad said. I need you to realize that these people are making mistakes and look and he would ask us, look how that person's life turned out do you want to end up that way? Mm -hmm. I'd be like, no. He's like, okay, what did they do? And then he would point out real life examples. And that's why I love it when people use anecdotes, when people use real life examples yes. in their stories, not be like, 
and the Bible said that you have to love people, right? Like they yeah. just be like, you, you can't just read me a PowerPoint and then expect me to grasp something. Yeah. The reason why I love it when people use real life examples is because that was the way that I was raised to learn lessons. Yes. It's like a story in a way. It right? is. It is a story. Yeah. So I always had a baseline understanding of morals and values, but I truly developed my own perception of what it means to have my version of morals and values with the way that I interpret the Bible now, with my life experiences now, with the books that I've read now. I've had a complete different paradigm shift and, you know, through relationships, through things that didn't work out, through jobs, through careers, all these things. It changes your, your perception on life. And then I've established, I believe, it's going to change in the future again, for yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. But where I'm at right now, I, I think that my morals and values have shifted a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I wasn't like a devious yeah, child. Yeah, you know yeah, yeah. I mean? Of yeah. course. You yeah. were just an 18 year old boy. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's so interesting to like think about that. Yeah. Like come back in this video yeah. in three years from now. And then you're going to be cringing too. You're right? going to be yeah. like, you guys are stupid. Yeah, yeah. Shut <laughs> yeah, up. Like, guys, get these imagine guys how off the much mic. better you're going to be now. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so uh, before we shift into some really fun topics, I just yeah. want to really know some things I'm interested in. Who would you want to work with and who are some of the, like, who would you want to work with on the social media sphere? Some influencers there. And then who's some of the biggest influences of your life? Um, I'm going to think of the first question in the back of my mind. So I'll answer the second one. Biggest influence is definitely my dad and my mom. My mom, the way she would speak to me is like she always knew that she was going to go early. It was very weird. And I say that because I was eight years old, very curious. I would ask all of these really mature questions. Mom, what is this? Why does this person act the way that why is this person's body language like this when I speak to them? And it was never you're too young for that. Or if I have a question about a movie, a topic, a political figure, whatever it was, whatever my curious brain thought of, she would answer it like I was 23 years old. It was never you're too young for this. Mm. Come back to me later. It was always the truth. If I had a question, she would answer it. And my dad, I've heard you talk about your dad in some other interviews as well. I feel like our dads are very similar. My dad would do the exact same thing. Every car ride is the same thing. It, talking, talking, talking. The second he walks in from work, okay, you know, still in his work attire, you know, wants to shower. He comes home. He's talking about his day. You need to do this. This is what we need to do. This is, this is, everything's a plan. Everything's this, that, the other thing. So the other day, he actually told me, I came home really late, especially for an Assyrian girl. Came home at 1.30. Oh! Right? How dare you? Yeah. Uh, how dare me? How dare yeah, you? I can't. I'm literally going to get stoned or something. They're going to stone <laughs> me. I came home at 1 30. And then the next day on the ring doorbell camera, he saw. And then he was like, Why were you out so late? And I was like, I literally told you where I was. I was with all my Assyrian friends at one of their houses, just chilling. And he's like, Why'd you come home so late? This, that, the other thing. He wasn't mad, but he was very curious. He's like, Okay, if you were to swap shoes with every single person Keep going. that you hung out with, would you be happy if you swap shoes like and he literally started naming all of my friends same thing he always says don't put your brother down don't put these people down like it's not an insult but it's a genuine question and he really made me reflect would i want to trade shoes would i be comfortable trading shoes with any of these people and he really made me think and he's always telling me that like you know your time is the most valuable thing and some people know that and they do not want to waste time by themselves so he said, like, most of the time, your friends who want to be in your present or whatever, and I'm not saying that, like, you know, your friends are out to get you or whatever, but they also feel better when they're doing nothing when you're by their side. And sometimes it's good. You want somebody's present. But he always tells me that, like, your time is valuable by yourself, especially working, especially don't waste it on people who want to call you out of the house to do nothing. Right. And it's very and I didn't understand when I was a little girl. It's like, what are you talking about? Of course. Right. But now it makes so much sense. Absolutely. And I, ha I've been learning to say no, no to my friends that I love so much, love so dearly. I just cannot hang out with you every single day. I have things I need to do. And he's, he always tells me like, there are people that are going to have free time every single spot of their life, every single day of their life. They're going to have free time. Do you want to be that person? Do you want to have free time every single day of your life? Is that something that you want to be when you're older? He's like me. He's like, how, how many times do you see me a day? I'm like one for maybe like two hours. He's like, yeah, because then I go straight to sleep and I wake up. I don't have time to go out. I don't have time to go out with my friends, meet friends. I don't even have time to make a friend. Do we have the same dad? Yes. What is this? Yeah, no, crazy. <laughs> I think we do. And, and you want to know why I think we do have very similar dad? Because we're both sitting here at the same time, which means every single one of our life choices 
every single thing that we've been through that we've learned led us to the exact same moment of time so i really do think our dads are very similar someone's smoking a cigarette right this isn't his analogy this is mine mm -hmm. when someone's smoking a cigarette they don't only want to smoke the cigarette by themselves they hand mm -hmm. another person a cigarette like mm -hmm. indulge with me yeah they want someone to die with them mm -hmm. right and so i understand that all too well it's it's you you don't want someone to exceed your levels because then you feel like you're being left behind so it really is crabs in a bucket where you pull people down mm -hmm. and and yeah I, I fully understand that sentiment and i think more assyrian dads need to be that way because this is an inside joke that me and my friends have where it's like when you see someone that's uh disillusioned or or, or a troublemaker let's say mm -hmm. in the assyrian community we're like oh yeah they grew up without it they have a, they have a typical mm -hmm. assyrian dad mm -hmm. like there's no such thing as like absent dads in the assyrian community yeah, there's no they such just thing. don't care like yeah. there's dads that don't care and if you have a dad that cares, you're so lucky. Yes. You're so lucky. A lot of people hate their dads because they care too much. Mm -hmm. And it's like they're cramping their style, whatever, right? Yeah. But it's like, man, you have no idea how blessed you really are by having a dad, a dad that cares. Um, person that you want to work with, people that you want to work with, think about that. Um, or does it kind of just go with the flow? Yeah, whatever. For me, it's like, I usually don't reach out. If I follow and they follow me back, boom, I'll hit them up. Mm. I'm like, I want to work with you. So you already alluded to this. You beat me to it. But I, the video that you had titled, you are not ugly. You are stupid. Yes. In the video, you and your friend, uh, you were speaking and you said, if you give yourself up to a man right away, you are unattractive. That was what you said. <laughs> yes. Okay. This is a two part question. First yes. part. Can you explain that a bit more? What's right? What's right away? What's too soon? What's the relationship status have to be like? What do you mean give away exactly? Like, what does that entail? Can you break that down for me so we can get really specific about this? Yes. Okay. Um, so what we were talking about is men perceive you as the, the first impression is very important. What you're wearing, what, how you talk to them, how you look at them. Um, what your intentions are clearly laid on the table is very important to a man. So I believe, and you could always obviously correct me if I'm wrong. If you were to give up yourself or sleep with a man very soon, as in like the first date, the second date, whatever, he is going to see you as this is immediate pleasure. I can see when I see her face, I know I get what I want when I want it because she's able to give me that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying like women are horrible and this, that, the other thing, and all women are this, that, the other thing. But what I am saying is you, it is very hard for a man to shift his mentality from you to be like, wow, this is somebody I need to work for. This is somebody, this is somebody I want to, you know, here's the thing. I'm not saying every single man does everything that they do to sleep with a woman. But in this culture, it's different. Sex used to be saved for marriage. It was, it was very different. Um, so leading up to marriage, men had to kind of prove themselves. Now I feel like when women and men date, it's like they are already married. There's not a lot that they have to change in order to put that ring on her finger. They live together. They sleep with each other. Uh, they're always together. There isn't a lot that they need to change to get married. So marriage gets delayed. So if you sleep with a man right away, there's not much he has to work for mm -hmm. and therefore he associates you with pleasure and obviously to every woman it's different and you know maybe some girls like i don't care like this is my you know hookup thing good for you but that's just what it is i feel like it's very hard to shift his mentality and be like hey no actually i want a real relationship i need you to pick me up at this time and drop me off at this time when you already told them your intentions with them so managing expectations in the very beginning is very important i completely agree with that if you yeah i, I there's something wrong that you said but i will say like so specifically this culture right mm -hmm. we have a perception that like this culture is starting to become like super degenerate like all of our traditionalist moral and values are no longer present i think um it's true to a certain extent mm -hmm. but when we look at time as always has been, prostitution is the oldest profession in the history of the world. Why? Because women have always saw that there was a market there because guys would fall for it. Mm -hmm. Guys would pay for it. They saw there's willingness to pay for it, right? So that that that, that level of, of, of availability for a woman uh, giving herself up for a man, it's always been there. And mm -hmm. this is famous mugshot by Frank Sinatra. I mean, like the, his mugshot of him at 23 years old is because in 1939, I think he... 
uh, slept with a married woman. That was what the mugshot oh my was. Goodness. So it was like, even back then, you're wow. like, oh, the 40s, traditional yeah. uh, mentality. It's like, no, even back then, people were doing oh, what we yeah, were doing today. It's just amplified and obvious because there's apps like TikTok yes. or um, Tinder, Bumble, yes. all these apps. And um, you see the promiscuity more so because we can show it on video, shoot it out there to the world to see, and it gets millions of views. But what you're saying, I think, is very right because it, it's dwindling with... The, tr the traditionalist society is dwindling at a faster rate now more so than ever. It's not that it does; it's completely gone. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, that's the first part of the question that you specified those things. Second thing, do you think a man's past should be held to the same standards as a woman's past? Woo! Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I believe so. And I'll say it's hard. I'd, I'd say yes. I'd say yes. If if a woman has a similar past as a man, I would still treat them the same. For example, I don't know if a lot of men agree with that because, you know, there's the whole lock and key analogy and, um, you know, women are supposed to be pure and, you know, something sacred. But I also believe that men should be like that as well. I think that men should, you know, save themselves. And I think here's the thing. I actually respect men who say no a lot more than a woman that says no. And I'll explain this. Women need to be emotionally driven to a man to really want to be with them all the time. A man is more body. Like I've, I've heard a lot of things where it's like, you know, men can do something with a woman without thinking. A woman doesn't really feel that connected unless she knows who the guy is. She might still do it, but she won't feel as connected whether a guy doesn't really matter. So I feel like that being said, men also have a higher sexual, I don't know what the word would sex be. Sex drive? Yes, higher sex drive than women. Um, so for them to keep saying no, for them to be like, no, I'm waiting. No, I'm waiting for the right one. Um, that shows so much self-control because mm -hmm. I see all of these men on these podcasts, right? And they're like, I have control financially. I have control in all of these aspects of my life. I have this, 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 but I still need four women. Why? Because that's the only desire they can't control. It's their sexual desire. So are you being hypocritical? Like when I see Andrew Tate, Love, love the guy. Sorry. Love the guy. Um, I think he has great takes, but he has control in all of these aspects of his life, right? Money, power, um, the way he talks to people. He has created this empire around himself. But when it comes to the woman thing, he's like, all men cheat. Guys, all men freaking cheat. You have to just pick the rest, the, the best one that's going to cheat on you. That's what he Are says. saying all women cheat? No, he says that all men will cheat on a woman. Like, oh, at, oh, he's, he's speaking towards women. He's like, all men cheat. You just have they're to pick the best one. They're saying they have to be okay that they're going to get yes, cheated on. Yes, you I just see. have okay, to okay. pick the most financially stable one. You mm. have to pick the best one out of the bunch because they're all going to do it. Why? Because he genuinely thinks he cannot control himself. That's what it is. So it's like, if you have control in all of these aspects, you have to have control sexually as well. So I do believe that men and women's past, they're equal. You can't say that a woman is this, that, and the other thing, and a man can have four wives, but it's fine because he's rich. Absolutely not. It's it's equal. I think purity in both sides is very important. And I actually respect men who, you know, wait, or let's say they had a really crazy past and mm -hmm. then had a morality shift. And he's like, you know what? Now I'm celibate or now I'm waiting or now I'm not going to, you know. Let's say his body count is 10. Okay. Let's okay. say his body count is okay. 10. But he all of a sudden he came to a come to Jesus moment. He's like, I'm going to be celibate until marriage. Okay. Does he deserve a virgin? Wow. That's a great question. Yes. Yes. That kind of negates everything you said though, because now she has a body count of zero. He has a body count of 10. Regardless, his just, his mindset and actions have shifted, but his past is still the same. So you, you can't really compare their pasts then, right? Yeah. So with that, I would just, the thing is, is let's say they were to meet, right? And he did not have that shift in his mindset, right? And he was still able, or he was still thinking sleeping with many women are okay. That would be different because it would be so, it would be in a way where he still thinks that sleeping with many women are okay. And she's, you know, obviously saving herself. Mm -hmm. I think that's different than a man who has, a, I really believe that if you 
go to Jesus and if you really repent and if you really have this moment, even if it's not a religious moment, if you really think like, you know what, from this point on, I am a different person. I believe that you are a different person. Just like how Jesus is like, you are, you are someone made clean. I don't even count those 10 bodies. That was a different version of you. Mm. I'm just focused on what you're doing now. So I guess it is hypocritical for me to say that, but in a way where I really do believe you are a new person. If you put your foot down and you're like, this is not me. This is not who I am anymore. That's a fair point. I actually agree with everything you said uh, in regards to like when guys are like, sex is like pissing for men, like a fresh and fit guys. Andrew Tate. I was, I love Andrew Tate. I like fresh and fit. I think they have a lot of good points that they make. <laughs> Honestly, they, I would say like 90% of the things I agree with what they're saying in terms of dating and, and uh, gaining respect as a man. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to like, trying to find justifications to cheat mm -hmm. i'm like man most guys can't even handle one girl you want to handle yeah four? good luck good luck brother and like it's just like you never see these guys committed married happy for too long trying to find justifications to cheat just don't get married i agree. just just don't but but then you can't look at a woman and tell her that she can't do the same thing. Now, listen, mm -hmm. I don't think a woman should be extremely promiscuous. I don't think that, you know, having an extremely high body count is okay and girl boss and all these yeah, things, right? No, like, me either. But I think also for a man, it is differently looked at when, it is. A, when a man has a higher body count. And I think it, it it's more natural and like something people just accept quicker. I think it depends on the nature of the human being also as well. Like I had a lot of friends of mine who would ask me, um, why are you waiting till marriage? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it's just in my nature. Like I, I a lot, I just, feel, I don't feel comfortable about it. Like there's just something in yes. my nature. And like a, a lot of guys would be like clowning on you. And then, but then when I realized those same guys that would clown on me, who got into committed relationships, got married. And when I repeated those same phrases, they would be like, yeah, bro, I totally get mm -hmm. where you're coming from now. And so I saved myself that heartache from making the same mistakes I would say they're mistakes I that mean. they made, but I didn't have to go through it. I just had to wait a long, a long enough time for them to go through it, for them then to come back to me yes. and be like, yeah, I mean, those experiences were cool, but, but, but it's like, <laughs> but but like, like I, you know, I'm with the person that I'm meant to be yes. with now. So that's the thing, men or women, I agree with what you said. It's looked differently for a man and for a woman. Mm -hmm. But when you were asking me these questions, I'm saying for me, to each their sure. own, yeah, right? Yeah. To each their own. Like if a guy has 20, a girl has 40, they want to be together, go go crazy, right? But for me, if like, he's like, I, I, I switched. I'm like, okay, I believe you, yeah. right? If you can wait with me, then all of those don't matter because you're new in Jesus's eyes. Who am I to sit here and be above God and be like, no, you haven't changed. If you went to God and asked for forgiveness and Jesus, Wept and you went and you took Urbana and you really truly believe and you know what who am I to say no you didn't I can't I really can't as just a human I, I can't do that yeah so when I see like a really good girl with a guy with like let's say five or six bodies right mm -hmm. and like and a lot of times within our community such a small community you know people's backgrounds yes you know who's been with who yes unfortunately uh we, we, <laughs> we yap too much and like for example we were sitting at the dinner table a few nights ago okay me and my four friends and my brother we're sitting there and a name pops up and we haven't talked to this person in 10 years. And now it's because we're gossiping. Yeah. Some, the name just popped up because of a certain incident. And, and we were talking about the incident that just happened. And we're like, dude, we know everything that happened in this person's life this week. We haven't talked to them in 10 yes. years. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? So then I was like, man, <laughs> like, I don't know if it's just our generation where we just talk too much or the other generations were too afraid to talk too yes. much. But regardless of the fact, we know people who... They're, they're past. And so when I see a girl who's a really good girl with a guy who's not the best reputation, mm -hmm. there's a side of me that wants to say, you don't deserve that girl mm -hmm. because that girl's really pure and you're not. Yes. Like I there's agree. a side of me that, that feels that way. But then there's also a side of me that's like, okay, I mean, like at the end of the day, I don't care who you're with. Yeah. Like if you, okay, you have a kid, be married, yeah. all these fun things. I wish you the best of luck. I don't personally get invested in care. Mm -hmm. But like a morality side of me, that's like, I look at that girl, I'm like, she deserves better. Yes. That's just how I look at it. And and I know what you mean. Like, and I also agree. Like when I see that, I'm like, like, I almost feel bad in a way. Like, oh, he's going to ruin her. That's what I think. Mm. Oh, he's going to do these things and change who she is. Like, it's almost like this because, you know, it's also drilled in our head at a young age. Don't do this. Don't do this. Right. So I have this like feeling where I'm like, oh, my gosh, I, I feel bad for her in a way. 
but I, I completely agree. I agree with what you're saying. She deserves to be with somebody m more like her. Right. But like I said, if he really truly changed, then I believe it. But another thing, what you were saying, like when um, your friends who got married and they came back to you and they were like, you were right. I completely agree with that. Like, I think of it this way. Every person you sleep with that isn't your husband or your wife is one more person you're going to have to tell your husband or your wife about. Like, really. If they're truthful. If they're truthful. I, I, yeah. The thing is, or you have to think about, you know, it's like, this is the most intimate part. This is shared between a husband and a wife once they're married. This, this, and there's a reason why the sex industry is everywhere because we as people were meant to recreate or met this is like the biggest thing this is the biggest thing it's for the us most right? relatable thing yes. for all of us yeah. so everybody like everything like only fans all of these things blew up because it's in the palm of our hands now you know what i mean it, it's crazy like this thing that was so sacred something that we all desire also yes, mm -hmm. everywhere. everywhere so now it's yeah. like it's like it doesn't matter anymore but really in reality this is what makes two people become one you literally become one and if you become one with so many people, you're not one with the one that you're supposed to be one with. Yeah, you know? what you're talking about is marriage. But, yes. But people don't understand the concept of marriage. So marriage is the combining of two souls for the rest of eternity. Yeah. When Beautiful. people get married, they're like, oh yeah, no, I'm just, you know, I got tax benefits now because I can write her off under, you know, being a personal person that I take care of. And, you know, we get to live together, we get to sleep together, it's cool. It's like, no. When you were in the church and the priest ordained that marriage, your souls were combined for the rest of eternity. Now you are a direct reflection of your wife and your yes. wife is a direct reflection of you. And like how we say, yes, the past is gone. You can't change it. You can't pass it. But you make the decision of who you combine your soul with and you have to be cognizant of that person's past. Can you deal with that? And if you can, that's fine. It's a beautiful thing. Cool. You're a better person than I can. For me, I don't make personal decisions in my life for instant gratification now, because I always think about, will the mother of my kids mm. this? Will my mother of my kids that? How am I representing my future children? I've been thinking about my future children since I was 16 years old. I don't even wow. have a girlfriend right now. Wow, wow. I've been thinking about my future kids since I was a teenager, me and my best friends. We always, we always talk about being a dad. Like that was our, because we loved our dad so much. We we're always talking about being a dad one day. So all the decisions that we make now, we've made a lot of mistakes. I'm not saying I'm a perfect human being yeah, and all yeah, these yeah, things, right? Course. We've had our experiences and through those experiences you learn, but you're, you, I look at it through a lens where I don't do certain things because one day my actions, like for example, me and you, we know each other now, right? And let's say you are now aware of me. We met today. You're now yeah. aware of me. We go out into the future, five years. Alyssa hears about Emmanuel's uh, past from the last three years. And then you have kids, I have kids. You're gonna hear about the things that I did and be like, hey, don't hang out with Their Emmanuel's kids. kids. Wow, I've never, yes. Because I know about Emmanuel and what kind of, kind of man that he is. I don't want you to be associated with his kids because probably those same morals and values are gonna be instilled in his kids and they're gonna rub off of you and you're gonna be ruined because of the bad influences. So it goes, it's that deep rooted. Yes. People don't think of it that way. And I'll tell you why people don't think about it this way. It's because of our community. We're Syrian, right? We have such a small, like, we're such a small population, right? So it's like, I know you and probably my cousin knows you or somehow like I've heard stories about you, this, that, the other thing. So we always have, we always have some connection no matter what. Right. If we get old, we get whatever. So these people that are like, oh, whatever, I'm never gonna see these people again. They don't have to keep that responsibility like we do. So we really have that instilled into our minds because it's true. Like once we have kids, oh, I don't want your kids hanging out with them. I absolutely agree. But I feel like our community and being a Syrian, all that also comes into play a lot with these kind of things. Yeah, it makes it harder for us. It's yes. like walking on eggshells. Yes. But surprisingly, you would think that everyone would be like super pure and like, because they don't want their reputation and to be tarnished. Mm -hmm. But in actuality, everyone's just doing things in the shadow. Agreed. And then it comes out in the light eventually yeah. because you're to be truthful with you a lot of the times it comes through your best friend's lips yes your friends tell other people their friends hey don't tell them that i said yeah. this and then it gets out and then that's why we're sitting at a dinner table and ta people, talking yes. about a person that we haven't seen in 10 years yes it's, it's like did true. you hear what they did it's like dude obviously your friend stabbed you in the back and leaked you that that stuff from you that's the sad part and so let's let's transition a bit so 
in a video with a friend that you, you we were talking about earlier behind the scenes, um, your friend in a video said something along the lines, said, men don't be a player, be modest. It's much more attractive. And I agree. But most of the times when guys are <laughs> modest, let me open the door for you. Yeah. I'll take the bill. I'll pick you up at this time, bring you flowers. What the girl do? Geek. Yeah. Geek. You're a geek. Yeah, you're right. You're a geek. I want someone who's tough. Yeah. That's why girls go for the jerks. That's a stereotype, right? Mm -hmm. Girls like jerks. Why do girls like jerks? Because they have qualities of leadership. They're assertive. Yes. They're dominating. They're they they make the decisions for you. The girl doesn't like, oh, okay, he's gonna yeah. take me here because he told me to wear this. And the, yeah. there's leadership factors in a jerk. It's just minus all of the bad yes. factors of a jerk, and you have a leader. Girls want a leader. They don't want a jerk, mm -hmm. right? But they get they get that mixed up, unfortunately. So I understand when your friend says, I want a modest guy, don't be a player. But that's actually bad advice because girls like that jerk player mindset. So what do you have to say about that? Do you agree with it? How do you help a dude out who wants to be modest naturally, but also needs to have that those jerk slash leader attributes so that you can actually get the girl, retain the girl, I love build a relationship? Question. Yeah. What's your definition of modesty? I think the way that I would say what modesty is for a man is the having the, the qualities and characteristics of a strong stoic leader, right? but having the ability to show a sensitive side, mm -hmm. not wear it on your sleeve, mm. but able to bring it out when you need to. And, and that the humility aspect of you can admit that you're wrong. You don't have to be overly a jerk. I'm always right. No matter mm -hmm. what kind of thing you, you have those capabilities of communication, but it's not the forefront of your mind. It's like you can, and you do when it's necessary. Mm -hmm. But Agreed. like the, the wimps are like, I'm such a nice guy. I always oh, like here. do all of these things for her. I can't believe she didn't pick me over. It's like you're, vic you're a victim. Yeah. You're a victim. The girls don't like victims. Hate that. I hate that. Well, he's not nice to you, but I, I'm so nice to you. Right. Get, leave. Right. Get out of here. Because for me, I'd say modesty is having humility. Yeah. It's like, it's like, you know, you hear modesty in the way you dress. You know, you don't want to overdress, underdress. You don't want to, you know, show a bunch of skin. Like modesty for me is like, it's a, it's a tough thing. So to answer your question, I agree. All of these attributes that a jerk has, right, is what women want. I was literally just telling my mom about this, my stepmom. We were mm -hmm. talking. Oh my gosh, I was like, I come out with my book, the book I was reading. I come outside and I'm like. Why is the main character going for the, the asshole? Why is he, why, why, why? Like, why is she going for the guy with the dark hair and he's so skinny? Why isn't she going for the actual, like, man that opens the door for her and that wants to marry her? And I'm, like, really getting mad because for the past 48 hours, I'm in this book. I'm reading this. I'm thinking I'm the main character. So when she's making these decisions to go for the bad boy, the one that, like, you know, risks it all and this, that, the other thing, I'm like, why? Why do women want this? And we literally sat and had this conversation today yeah. over breakfast. Good warm up. Yeah, literally. And everything's connected. So you're absolutely right. When we see a rude person or a jerk or whatever, nine times out of 10, they're pumped with testosterone, going to the gym, this, that, the other thing. They don't care. A woman usually is the opposite. Very feminine. Oh my gosh, he's so strong. He's so big. He's so this. He, he just wants to take control. We love that. I eat it up, eat it up, eat it up. I love it. I think it's great. I love men who act like men. Great. The thing is, it is kind of hard to find a balance. A man who is able to have all of those really manly masculine qualities, but still lower himself to open a door to talk to you about your feelings, mm -hmm. Men who bottle things up and, you know, I'm a man, I shouldn't talk about this stuff. The other thing, imagine having a conversation about how they feel barf. It's it, nearly impossible They're Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Ah, and they get angry and they get frustrated. Having that balance is, is very hard, but a woman would be most happy with that balance. Like, mm. so I agree that men actually should be modest in their action, but how they show themselves Here's what I think. This is for men out there. This is my guide, okay? When you go on a first date, don't be overly nice. Don't bring flowers. Don't do all of these things. Don't be the first one to lower yourself. Desperate. Don't be desperate. Mm. And people think like kindness and desperate are not the same, but it can look like that. Because at the end of the day, like I would think it's 
nice if he opened the door for me, right? Sat me down, whatever. But that was it. You have to play your cards mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Because if you're too nice, if you're too, I'll do this for you and I'll do this for you and you're the love of my life. I'm good morning, beautiful sunshine, rainbow lollipop. I'm so glad you awakened today. Get out of my face. Like, no, it's nice, but you're a man. This is a game at the end of the day, to be honest with you. It is a game. It's a mind it game. It's, a, it's all about psychology. I, I hate to say that it's a game, but it is for women and for men. Like I said earlier, you can't be 100% like men also need you to warm up to you. They need to get a feel in the water. You can't just right away jump into everything. This is all my trauma. This is everything I've been through. Here it is. Right. Here it is. And then for right. a man, they can't just be like super overly I love you, I love you, I love you right away. It, it is for both sides. So it's not just men, oh, women are so confusing and women need to do this. It's also for men. It's, it's, it, it goes both ways. There was a time where there was a girl that would call me every day and just complain. Like one time she called me and she, without even asking me like, how am I doing? How's your day? All this, she's straight right into it. Yeah. And I was like, dude, why am I picking up her phone calls? Yes. Like it clicked on me like one of these days. Yeah. I was like maybe 19, 20. And then I was like, yeah, I'm just not gonna pick up her call the next time she calls. And then so, you're actually in a way disrespecting the person that you're calling. You're not respecting their time. Mm -hmm. You're not respecting their energy. You don't even ask them how they're doing and like care about Agreed. like what's going on with them. And the world's always about you. You're a self-centric person. So you make everything about you. It's like, why would someone pick you over another person if you can't reciprocate that energy back to them? It's mm -hmm. always about you. You're always taking. It's a relationship. And so um, I actually think that the state of the world where men and women are today, it's men's fault. I actually do think it's men's fault. A lot of guys would be like, look, all these girls, they, they're HOEs. They don't know how to be proper wives today and all these. Uh, guess what, man? You created them to be that way. And I'll tell you exactly why. So the traditionalist relationship standards of today, like our grandparents generation doesn't hold that standard anymore. Because, for example, women will go out there. She'll show some extra skin. And then all of a sudden she gets attention. And that sends her a signal. Oh, guys like this. So then she keeps doing it. And then more guys like it. And then other girls be like, man, that girl's getting all the attention. So maybe I should do that. So then she starts doing it. And then it's a chain effect. And all of a sudden you have all these girls who then start these social media apps who then get validated by the numbers because the guys are liking it. They're consuming it. The girl's posting videos with butt pics or whatever. And then the guys are watching it. They see their views go up. And so they're getting positive feedback loops. Those girls are getting signaled that guys like this, yeah. other girls want to be like that, yeah. then more girls become that. And then it's like an endless vicious it cycle is, yeah. because guys mm -hmm. are falling for, or, or, or yeah, guys are falling for the bait being set out there. And then women are being validated by those brainless monkey men that yeah. <laughs> fall for it. So and I completely agree. Yeah, I, I just think that if men had more self constraints and self control. And then when they saw a girl post like that, instead of being like, damn, dude, let me send this to my boys and like that and slander her DMs and be like, don't interact with it. Yes. All of a sudden, all of those posts will stop being posted because girls will be like, oh yeah, nobody, my ass is on the internet. Like, kind of, like barf, like what? Like, like they would realize like all of a sudden, if, I'm not, if I didn't get any likes on this picture, my butt is on the internet. The way like, and you're absolutely right because the way like you said my butt's on the internet and I pictured your butt on the internet and I was like, <gasps> that's so embarrassing. We don't wanna see that hairy mess. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's, it's insane that, that like if you just don't engage with the content, yeah, people have a realization, oh, nobody actually it's likes this. Ridiculous. And then they go back to the traditional society that we have. So that's why that, I, I just think men need to step up. I agree and I think like, literally even going back to the bible right we're from adam's ribs adam we're from his his ribs and then we went and we ate the apple we made the mistake he never stopped us never done anything about if anything he was right there right mm -hmm. he did it after us that in itself literally we if a man would tell me don't do this like my dad would to tell me do not do this okay that's what it is it's it's that like don't do this, whatever. It's that the authoritative authority. respect factor. Yes. Yeah. And men are lacking that now. They're like, you know what? It's not my girlfriend. It's not my mother. It's not my sister. I don't care. It's just an ass that I put no correlation to. It's a selfish way of thinking. This is not hurting me because it's not anyone I know. It's not tied to my identity. Double tap. Right. So that's really what it is. And now it's all of these women that are doing this. And like you said, they understand that they can get a reaction from it. Right. And, and all the time these women are like, oh, I'm, 
I hate men. I'm doing this not because I love men, be, but because I hate men. Yeah, because, sprinkling some feminism yeah, in there. Now it's, they, it's your body. Yeah. It's your right to do that. You should, you're empowered to do that. So but what now they're doing is what people like to do when they know they're wrong or when they're guilty or not doing the right thing, they will give reasons to why they do it to kind of make themselves, hey, this is not an excuse, but this is the reason why I do it. Mm. I do this because I actually don't like men and I love emptying their pockets. I love, that's what, that's what these creators are saying. I love emptying their pockets. I love feeding into desperate men so I can profit off of them. So now mm. it's a feminist thing. Now it's like, oh, you do OnlyFans? Oh, me too. Oh my God, girl, period. I hate men too, period. It's like an actual thing. So, and these women are literally like, it's lose lose for everyone. These but if the guys stopped weaker. consuming their content, they would all of a sudden yeah. have nothing to rely on. Ag agreed. So yes. in a way, women validating their actions is wrong. Yes. But if the stream of income and the views and the numbers stopped, they would change their ways, mm -hmm. I guarantee you. And they would realize how stupid their behaviors are being. So both of us have things to play. Yeah, we, we both can improve on. But let me ask you this. If the following are green flags or red flags in a man. Okay. Works out. Uh, green flag. Works out, but is a gym rat. Red flag. <laughs> Smokes weed. Red flag. Smokes anything. That depends. Cigars, cigarettes, hookah. Uh, I'd say like that's like a beige flag. Beige flag? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'd be in the middle. Cries in front of you. Green flag. It depends. Um, I mean, like, okay, if I just met you and you're no, actually, green flag. Whatever. Has tattoos. I don't care. Beige flag. <laughs> Let lets you pay for dates. Green flag. A I, man. I, I'll explain why. Okay. A man who's more serious than he is funny. That's not my cup. It's not a red flag. Like, I'm not saying like those men are bad, but I would not go for that. So. Yeah. But red flag or green flag? Uh, beige to red, <laughs> yes. A man who's very funny, but never serious. That's a red flag. High sex drive. That could be a green flag down the line, but red flag for right now. Obsesses over grooming and self-care. Uh, I think that's maybe red. Flag? No, no, this green flag. You. If it's hygiene, if it's like hygienic. Right, it's hygienic. Oh, okay, yeah, green flag. Goes to the clubs every weekend. Uh, red flag. Has a jealous personality. A red flag. Love bombs you or says I love you multiple the red times flag. a day. Red flag. Cares <laughs> about politics. Red flag. Isn't religious. Like double red flag, like this. What do you mean like this? You said that you wanted to go back on uh, someone who lets you pay for dates. Yeah, so I believe that men should pay for dates. Mm -hmm. I do, but mm -hmm. listen, like if, if he's paying all the time, right? And we're going to get an ice cream or something. And like, I want to do a kind gesture. He should not flip tables over. Oh, I need to pay. Like you should also, if you need to, it's split 50, 50 relationships, 50, 50. If I feel like I want to pay, if I feel like, Hey, it's okay. If I, if I offer to pay and I'm like, Hey, I want to pay and he won't let me. Okay, cool. If he does let me, I think that's good because it's like, you're not too ego to, it's not going to hurt your ego yeah i can actually back up with what you're saying i made that mistake a few times and so early on in a relationship with a girl i used to date i used to never let her pay yeah um i realized that and when she would offer mm -hmm. i realized that when you're not letting them pay you're not letting the woman become invested in the relationship mm -hmm. the same way that the man is invested in relationships so if that relationship doesn't work out the man takes it harder than the woman because she's mm -hmm. like all right well what do i got to lose i was with the person and like you know i, I didn't put money speed. into yeah. it but then if you let a woman put money into it if she offers right then what that does is she's now invested in it and she'll think twice before making a decision that's irrational and she'll be like ah i should have money Tied invested. up in this relationship, invested into <laughs> this relationship. Of that. It's just another, it's another psychological <laughs> yeah. game. And I actually learned that from a book called, um, damn, what's that book called? It's by Robert Glover. It's called No More Mr. Nice Guy. Fantastic book. I recommend every man to read that before the age of 18. You got to know those things in that book. Let's say your best friend starts an OnlyFans account tomorrow. <laughs> your best friend, you love this person to death. What's the first thing you do? Do you cut them off? Do you talk them out of it? Do you give them advice? Do you stick around? What do you do? Okay. Um, if they just out of nowhere started one, I would send them their account and be like, what the hell are you doing? I, I would try to talk to them like out of it. 
I wouldn't even be friends with people who would even consider that. But let's right. say they just did it yeah. out of nowhere. I would be so shocked. I would be so shocked. I think I would try to talk them out of it. I would try to, um, and if they're like, no, 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 I would cut them off. I do not want to be associated with that at all. And it might be selfish and it might be like, oh, like you're not a, you're not a very um, open-minded person. You're a judgmental person. Oh, Alyssa, you don't understand. I have to pay bills. I have to pay bills. You're Congratulations. Being, you're being selfish right now. This is so my is body. My, this is my body and my choice. Congratulations. It's not, okay, if it's your body, I do not want to be associated with your body. That's what it is. After everything we've been through, yes. you're just going to cut me off like yes. that? Because you want to know why? Because you don't respect yourself as much as I respect you. I don't want to be friends with you. But you don't understand my situation. Nobody's giving me money. I don't have a degree. My college tuition's out the ass right now. What am I supposed to do? Get a job. Who's going to hire me? No one's hiring me. You no one's hiring. Try, you didn't try hard enough. But I can't get anything. I put my resume into like three, four different places. I will help you get a job. How can you help me? I can help you in any way possible. Start a TikTok and I'll help you. You help me become an influencer? <laughs> yes. You want to you be known to many people on the internet? Just do what do you're it. doing with yeah. your clothes yeah, on, dude. Period. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I understand. The reason I asked that is because. Here's the thing. I'm not like, I don't hate all of these women who have OnlyFans. I'm not like these uh, women are HOEs. I don't, but for me to be friends with somebody, I have also, I also have a platform. If my best friend is doing, it loses my credibility as well. This is also my business. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And on top of it, it's like, I don't want to know that you are posting these pictures and videos of yourself. And on top of it, I'm bringing you home to my family. My family knows I'm friends with you. What are they going to think? Yeah. You know, going into the Assyrian community for a bit. So we're both Assyrian. What do you what does it mean for you to be Assyrian? Can you tell me about that? Well, I didn't know for the longest time, honestly. I didn't know what it meant to be Assyrian. And I didn't I also didn't like it because I did not understand it. Like mm. I grew up um, with a lot of different uh, cultures, different backgrounds, um, and many of them were like similar to each other. And I felt like mine was very different. Our wedding's very different. You know, when I'd hear the music, when I hear like the Zorna, mm. I would literally get angry. I'd be like, what is that? Why is that? Like, because I feel like as, as I grew up, I, I've noticed that whenever I don't understand something, I get very angry or hostile towards it. I don't know what that is about my personality, but I've noticed that happen. So because I didn't understand what it meant to be a Syrian, because I didn't understand why everyone's so proud to be a Syrian, I didn't understand the culture, the food, the music, the people, the language. I didn't understand how to read, write or speak it. Mm. I didn't like it at all. But it wasn't until like I grew up, um, you know, I started getting involved with my youth group, my church. So actually, my religion brought me to my culture. Right. So, um, you know, I in quarantine, I bought my first Bible myself and I read so much of it. You see my Bible, there's sticky notes all around it. It's all colorful, whatever. You'll see it at church tonight. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and then I went, um, moved to California, right? And then um, my dad was like, you need to get involved, right? And my stepmom was like, you need to get involved with your youth. These are your people. These are, and I'm like, no, they're not. Da, da, da. Anyways, they forced me. I went, met all of my best friends, got close to everyone. I'm like, maybe this isn't that bad. Why did I hate it so much? I started learning how to read and write it a little bit just because of like a Syrian school. I started getting involved in my church. I teach Sunday school to the oh, little wow. the little kids. And I just got involved with my church and it brought me to my culture. So what it means to be a Syrian to me is to be like connected. Unif and it's funny because the thing is, is like there's so much diversity in the Assyrian, you oh, know, yeah. you already know how it is. But I really, truly believe it means to be like connected and the language, knowing your past, your history, religion. Um, it's keeping your culture alive. That's what it really means to me. It's like, you know, and shining light on it that it's not just like some traditional, like old news. It's cool to be a Syrian. I love being a Syrian and I think it's important to talk about it. I think it's people like you that shine a light on it. I mean, the amount of views that you've gotten from videos from us at conference last yeah. year and like the dancing and like just the youth events, it's beautiful. And like you are actually helping shine a light on it and keeping that mm -hmm. alive and exposing it to the rest of the world. So you're doing your part, I think. Yeah. Um, if you could fix one issue within the Assyrian community, <laughs> what would it be and how would you start the process? This is a very good one. I feel like lots of Assyrian people have very strong opinions and no facts, proof, or evidence to back anything up. 
So, and that creates a division. I would fix the fact that we already don't have a lot. We are dealing with very small numbers. There's not a lot of us. And we're still dividing, renaming, rebranding, giving excuses as to why we're not one. And it just keeps dividing. So the issue I would want to fix is to stop being divided. I would want everybody to be unified. I want everybody to be proud of their heritage, everybody to um, be with each other, everyone to be one, basically. And I would, I feel like the way to fix that is by getting people educated, mm -hmm. for them to understand where they come from, what their roots are, how to learn the language. Like if they truly understood the history, the true history of absolutely everything that their people have gone through, that would change a lot of division because they truly understand everything. So it's a beautiful in concept. And that's the exact mindset that I had. It could happen. Um, but going to a person who's believed a certain thing about their whole entire life, mm -hmm. that's their identity. And you tell them, Hey, actually, buddy, I know you better than you know you. You're wrong your whole life. I know better mm -hmm. than you do who you really are. This is who you are. You're like, who the hell are you? Yeah, of course. How could you say it? Like, they're going to be combative with you. Mm -hmm. So I agree with you that a lot of, you know, things, if it's because of miseducation and, and a lack of education, that why we are divided in, in today's time, we could change that with the way that we move forward, making sure that bad information is washed out mm -hmm with good information. Exactly. I, I agree with that completely. Yeah. So it wouldn't be like, you are actually this, yeah. you are actually that. Right. It would just be pushing that good, yeah, yeah, good information out, whether mm -hmm. it's on social media and all of these things. And that's what I started doing with my social media, just being myself, who is also an Assyrian girl. I am not Assyrian Alyssa, I'm Alyssa, who is Assyrian. And I feel like that's also something that people who are very proud in being Assyrian. It's all their identity. That's their whole idea. You are still yourself. You are just, this is who you also are, you know? Right. I mean, people say like, you know, everyone, can, everything can be taken away from me, but the one thing that can't be taken away from me is my identity, which I understand that sentiment. Like, that's a beautiful thing too, but making your whole identity is like, bro, there's 4 million of us. Yeah. There's 4 million Assyrians. Yeah. Are you saying that you're no different than the other 4 yeah. million people of us? Like, yeah, like. I know there's not that many of us and it's a really unique thing and beautiful, but like be your own person. You know, there's yeah, more yeah, to you on. than just Shiga Yakura. Yeah, I know. Oh my gosh, more thank you. you. By the way, thank you. Because this is like, because I'm now like talking about Assyrian people and people are like, you need a, I cannot believe you are um, making TikToks to American music. Why aren't you using your native tongue? I would say something this year and very rude, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but like literally, literally why, literally why? Like, uh, and then, and then, and then I'm like, okay, you know what? You're right. So then I'll, then I'll do a song in Assyrian. I'll sing a song, dance, whatever. Be like, okay, but why aren't you speaking it? Get lost, literally get lost. It's like, they're like, okay, now that you're Assyrian, now that you are Assyrian, you need everything about you has to be Assyrian. They probably criticize you in English, by the way. Yeah, and they do, they literally do. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, get your, air make keyboard out and right. see yeah right. go ahead last question are women funny <laughs> um wait i have such a good answer to this i have such a good answer to this yes and no and i'll explain why that's such a cop out okay 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 okay, okay. Give, it, give it give it let's hear it. so i do believe that men are funnier than women and here's the thing, when you say, when you say like, like I'm a comedian or whatever, and I make content, that's funny content. The second I tell someone, yeah, I make content on social media and they're like, oh, what is it? And they immediately think it's provocative. And I'm like, uh, no, like humor. And they're like, Psh, okay. Right. And I'll tell you why this happens. I believe that some women can be hilarious, but when I am funny, people perceive me as masculine. So listen. When my makeup is all done like this and I look good, I, I literally cannot sit in front of a camera and be funny. It just doesn't work and I don't know why. It just doesn't work. And it's this phenomena that I see in other women too. They're like once my makeup and hair is done, I cannot be funny. Mm. And it's because we play our roles. I'll tell you this. In the animal kingdom, what color is a female peacock? Blue. No, a female peacock. Oh, white? What color it's like, it's like whites, grays, yeah, white. browns. Yeah. 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 And then the male peacock is all of these extravagant different colors. In the animal kingdom, a woman will sit like this 
and a man will come and entertain and dance, do their thing, yeah. dance, mm -hmm. whatever. So humor in a way is the biggest flattery for women. That's why women love funny men. So it's actually a way for us to be like, oh my gosh, this is, by the way, this is my analogy guys. So I didn't learn this from anything. I just saw this and I was like in bio class, they were like, yeah, they entertain the women. I'm like, this is literally what men do in the human world too. They entertain, they make us laugh, whatever. And I feel like women can be really funny, mm -hmm. but when I am the funniest, people always say that I'm a very masculine girl and that I'm like a boy and this, you should act like a girl, you shouldn't do, but it's only when I'm cracking jokes online. So I do think women can be funny, but I think being funny is a masculine trait and I know I'm gonna get hated for it, but that's actually where I think it stems from. The funniest girls to me are the ones who are the most masculine. I'm just saying. And that's yeah. yeah. And it's it's hilarious. And I will sit and lie. And I don't think like she's less of a woman because she's funny. But they say things that a man would say. Right. And it's funny. Right. It's really it's it's hilarious. Well, I'm glad that you recognize that. Yeah. And I think you'll be on a really good path yeah. with the men audience. <laughs> Alyssa, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah.